in the parable that you told of the master and the emissary, mm. I might argue mm. that the responsibility for the failure of that civilization or tribe or whatever you want to call it was the masters, not the mm. emissaries. Because the master obviously misassessed. The master would probably have agreed with you. Yes. <laughs> and so rather than say the master was wise and the um, emissary wasn't, so he did a Dunning-Kruger thing and messed it all up, the master was missing a certain kind of wisdom in his assessment of mm. the actual realistic capabilities of the emissary. There was some stuff in his noticing the whole that he wasn't noticing that was really critical for him to ultimately still hold responsibility. So there's, a, there's an uptick in the master capability that could have kept mm. that relationship right. Yes. So there's something about needing to be power literate uh, to be able to keep power mm. from corrupting a relationship with the sacred. I mean, rather than say that the master was deficient in some way, one would say that there was an important relationship here which required a certain degree of vulnerability. So the master couldn't <coughs> remain invulnerable because he realized that he needed to not concern himself with certain things if things were to survive. So there isn't a squeaky clean answer to this. He had in a way to trust. In some ways, it's very like the story of God and Satan, that Satan was Lucifer, the light bringer, the brightest of the angels, God's right hand. And because of his um, power hungriness and his envy of God, everything fell to ruin. But at the end of that story isn't ruined, because Christianity, again, uh, I, I'm becoming more and more convinced during our conversation, if nothing else comes out of it, how very, very important the, the sort of overarching effect of a religion such as Christianity is for the survival of a civilization. I mean, I've always felt that, but I see it more and more in what we're talking about. But what, you're, what you've uh, adverted, to, adverted to earlier was the, the necessary sort of supervision. And that is a difficult balancing act, as it is for the master and the emissary. And there's another fable which I tell at the beginning of part three of The Matter with Things, which is an Onondaga legend, they're an Iroquois people. And they have the story of how, you know, because creation was waning, there were these two brothers who were sent to sort of regenerate the power of the universe. And these brothers are not equal. Um, like the master and the embassy. One of them is wise, and he is called the one that holds the, the earth with both hands. The other is called hard as ice, the flint. And his value is that he, he's got a, a tool that his father gave him, which is speech, and the other is an arrow with which he can shoot. Now, this is an extraordinary, just starting there, division between, as it were, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. But the story gets better and better as it goes on. I can't tell the whole thing, but there's, those are interested in the recording on YouTube of me reading the, the introduction of this chapter in which, which we tell the, the story. But effectively what the good brother realises is the bad brother tries to imitate the good brother because he's envious of him. He sees the good brother creating all kinds of wonderful things, um, birds and beasts and flowers, and he tries to create and he produces only thorns and flies and bats. And um, there's a sort of sense that he is dangerous left to himself, but he must also not come too close to the good brother because the good brother needs to preserve a degree of his independence without which he is no longer himself. So they, they can't fuse, but one needs to be subservient to the other. The one needs to have power over the other. But that is not something that can ever be secured 100%. Right. So you can never have the situation where the one that is wise has that power, because one of the terms on which wisdom exists is that it sees beyond power. Now, I know that you've made a very good point that there needs to be a certain degree of sort of watchfulness and power um, awareness. I, I agree about that. But quite how this is managed in a way that doesn't actually vitiate the whole business of wisdom, because in most cultures, wisdom is associated with, well, in, in, in Chinese, with wu wei, with, within action. You know, the, the master does nothing, but nothing is left undone. Um, the, these remarkable and beautiful sayings of the Taoist literature um, so we, we have to somehow find a way 
of making that work. And I don't know what your ideas about how that could be made to work are. 